My name is Bridget Regan, and I'm one of the literacy consultants here at Wayne Risa. I've been here just about three years now, coming up on my three-year anniversary here, and just so excited to be with you this afternoon um, as we come together, you know, to talk about motivating um, in the motivation in the literacy classroom. And I'm joined by my co-host Heather. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Heather Ratterman, and I'm an assessment and instruction consultant with Wayne Risa, also coming up on my three-year anniversary with Bridget. Um, and this, um, I, I love working with our literacy team, and I'm lucky to work across our disciplines at Risa, but the lit literacy is near and dear to my heart. My background is actually a reading specialist, so excited to talk about um, motivation and engagement with you today. All right, so to get us started, it's fun for us to engage in a quick connector just to get our brains moving and thinking. So this particular activity is called This or That. It's gonna require you to open up the chat. So if you can find that chat feature and Heather and I are gonna take turns alternating, kind of calling these out. So you can do this activity with your students as well. And it is a fun way to engage them. If you're gonna find yourself in a virtual setting, you can go about it in the way that we're doing um, today with you, but you could also get creative and do this in person um, and have kids perhaps hold up popsicle sticks to indicate you know, which choice. Um, you could probably do it with choice boards. There's so many different ways, but once we start to play, you'll see how this goes. So I'm gonna pose two things aloud to you and you're gonna put your favorite, which one is your preference in the chat? So let's start with the techie one up here. Let's start with Twitter and Facebook. Are you a Twitter person or a Facebook? So please open up the chat and we'll see what responses come in. And Heather, let me know what you're seeing. So far, overwhelmingly Facebook. Okay. I think I shared this earlier on the call. So if you're on the call earlier today, um, my daughters tell me this one ages me. I also would select Facebook. Um, I know Heather would have a different answer that's probably not on the screen at all. No, nope, I'm an Instagram user. All right, let's go to the next one. Let's try tacos or pizza. What's your preference, tacos or pizza? This one's pretty evenly split. Tacos and pizza. All right, let's move to our next one, thinking about fall football, whether we want to admit it or not, summer is coming to an end here soon. So are you a, a Wolverine or a Spartan, U of M or Michigan State? This one's always fun to see. We have some people say neither, yep. I'm seeing some neither, I'm seeing a lot of Michigan, I'm seeing some Spartans. All right, let's, let's tap into our uh, perhaps TV binge watching from the pandemic times. Do we have any um, Schitt's Creek fans or Mandalorian fans? Any of those? Mm, seeing a lot of neithers, but I'm also look a lot of Schitt's Creek too. Yeah, you're, if you're looking for a, um, a funny a funny comedy, Schitt's Creek is definitely uh, one to consider. All right, how about spring or summer? Lots of summer. We have a few springs in there too, but lots of summer, overwhelmingly summer. All right, and then our last one, fruits or veggies? This one's also overwhelmingly fruit, but I'm seeing some veggie fans in there. I prefer veggies. All right. We're saying both, awesome. Okay, thanks so much for playing. This is a fun one to do with kids. And if you Google, you know, this or that, sometimes it's called, um, I forget the other name that it's called sometimes. I've seen when I've done some searches on the internet, but you can find like lists already ready to go that are great for kids, for young kids as well, with some of the pop culture things that they're into. Um, so we invite you to consider how you might use this type of poll or survey around um, interest in your, in your classrooms with your students as well as a way to help motivate and engage them. Okay, we're gonna um, get you doing some thinking and inking. So hopefully you have some paper nearby or something that you can jot on. That's how the, we're gonna encourage you to kind of take some notes along the way and capture some of your thinking in our session today. And we'd like you to consider the following prompt. Um, think back to when you were in school, what were the ways in which teacher, staff or administration motivated you to read or write? So we're gonna engage in what's called a thinking share. So you're gonna do some thinking and inking to get started. 
and then we'll take um, a few minutes when we're done to do some sharing. So I'm going to pause now and just give some folks some think time. And it's up to you how far back you want to go in school. If you want to go all the way back to elementary school, or if you want to think about your middle school, or perhaps even your high school time, or all three, um, or perhaps even your time in college, um, whatever works for you. So I'm going to pause now and give folks some, a good minute and a half to do some thinking. Try to be as detailed as you can. Let's tap into some of our own experiences. If you're just joining us, please make sure that you grab that sign in link in the chat. And then we're just engaging in the prompt on the screen, inviting you to do a little um, reflective writing. And we're gonna take about 30 more seconds of some individual think time. And then we'll do some sharing in just a moment. All right, if you could bring your, your thinking to a close and your, your writing to a close, what I'd like to invite you to do now is to um, put some things in the chat, but we're also hoping that somebody might be willing to unmute and share um, some of their thinking aloud as well for the group. So it's not just Heather and I talking this whole time. Um, so if you're interested and you're willing to share aloud, um, please feel free to unmute at this time and let us know what you're thinking at the time. Um, hi, my name is uh, Julie DeGudis, but I go by um, Jules. And for me, sorry, my GPS is going crazy. I am so sorry. Um, it's okay, can we can now? hear you. Yeah, okay. we can hear you, um, Jules, go ahead. So, um, so um, this year I'm in a new position. I normally teach sixth through eighth grade uh, I taught ELA math or science, but I'm going to be teaching fifth grade. But um, in high school, um, there was a creative writing class, and it was normally for juniors and seniors. Um, but two or three of us, one freshman and two sophomores, were in a creative writing class. And every Friday, we had like a coffee hour. He also set out tea. Um, but whatever we were learning about um, poetry style-wise, we would share on Fridays. And then what I loved is that um, eventually he challenged us to actually uh, go to coffee houses and share our poetry at like poetry jams. And I just loved how, you know, he wanted us to see like what others were doing in the community. And I would say that was probably one of my favorite classes because yes, you needed to revise, but at the same time, you had a lot of space to be able to share your past experiences or really dig deep of things that were going on with you personally. Thank you so much, Jules, for, for sharing that. As I um, think back about what you were sharing, a couple of things stood out. Um, your teacher allowed you to tap into some of your own interests and then provided you with a real life experience literally by going to the coffee shop, right? Which is um, something that you've obviously held on to this, this whole time, um, which is, is pretty powerful, just that in of itself. And I'm noticing, Heather, I'm sure you're seeing it as well. Um, some of the things in the chat where people have listed times where they've been able to attend an experience. Um, I see here, someone wrote about um, being able to attend a field trip to see the play in the theater live, right? Kind of bringing that literature to life. Um, I'm seeing mm -hmm. folks, yeah, put some things in here about choice. Okay, would someone else like to share? I'll share. Um, hi, my name is Chris. And um, one of the things that was really motivating was the opportunity to, to be able to pick your own books, like you get to choose, mm -hmm. but reading wasn't assigned. And writing was, um, encouraged because it was like a free write in your journal and it was opportunities to not just write but to draw however you wanted to express yourself mm -hmm. um, and that was encouraged and, and it was very motivating. All right thank you so much for sharing that Chris. We're going to talk a bit more about some of the very things that you just said putting choice in right and the power that that has for motivating. Now I think if you, when I think about when I first started teaching, I've been in education 27 years, right? I had more um, liberty, if you will, early on in my career as a teacher to make some of the choices in what I was teaching and how I was teaching, at least as I think back on it, right? And now 
when you think about some of the mandates and the things that we have to do, I think sometimes our teachers today feel as though they've lost that autonomy to do some of those things and to bring that choice in as Chris was just sharing. And Heather and I are here to share with you, we need to bring those things back, right? I'm certainly not saying don't um, teach what your district or your school expectations are, but we have to now kind of think outside the box as to how we can bring some of that back in. Because as I'm looking through all of these examples that I see that you typed in the chat, all of them have um, something to do either with choice or an experience. Um, and, and we need to um, remember why that engage that in us as learners. And so we, you know, we owe it to our students to do the same. It's going to have to look perhaps a little different. So we're going to do some thinking around that today. Heather, anything to add on this before we move on to our next section? Actually, yeah. So Stephanie put in the chat that she recalled the, the Pizza Hut reward mm -hmm. system. And I, I, was, I also recall that in, in third grade. And it was called Book It. And you had to earn with so many pages or books that you read, you earn little stars on this pin. And then once you had it full, you get to go, you got to go to Pizza Hut and get a personal pan pizza. So that was one of the things that I recall, um, not necessarily motivating me, but as a strategy that teachers were using when I was in school. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that today, right? That, that very thing and what the current research says um, around that. I think that's maybe actually a great segue to this right now. So Heather, I'm going to turn it over to you and I'll let you explain some of the little icons and then some of our text that we have here on the screen. Yeah. And so I'm glad Stephanie put that in there because the way we structured that question, it was kind of an either or. You could put things in there that maybe um, were motivating at the time, but may not be so motivating now, or things that teachers really did do so that they, you could foster a love of reading and writing. But what research has really found is that there's some common myths around what works to get our kids reading and writing. And one of the things that they have found is that um, when you have, um, when you use extrin extrin extrinsic rewards, such as pizza or food, or candy, um, or really anything, a reward in general, kids are gonna actually read less. So what this means is that we really shouldn't be um, trying to use um, things or junk, sometimes it's referred to as a way, as like the carrot to get our students to be reading. So oftentimes we see them as reading incentive programs like Book It, we, also, we often see it in things like a token economy or a behaviorist model. So you get to earn so many stickers and then you can trade those stickers into um, get a toy from, from the toy box or the treasure box. Um, and we also don't want to see things like if you read so much, you get points or a grade because then we're not fostering that love of reading. I'm reading just to get a grade. I don't know if any of you remember Accelerated Reader, but I remember it from middle school. And that was directly connected to the grade that I earned in my English language arts class. I had to read so much and earn so many points. And that was the teacher at the time thought that that was the, the most appropriate way to foster that love of reading. But research really indicates that it's not. And there are other ways that we're gonna talk about today that we can get our kids reading and writing for the sake and of love to read and to write. And Marilyn, I'm just seeing um, what you listed in the chat here that you just recently finished a training about rewarding scholars to read. Um, yes, it, it is still out there. I, I don't want to, you know, dis, discredit that. We know that, that that is out there. But when we look at the actual research, as Heather has said, and you can see that's a fairly recent study by Marinek and Gambrell in 2016, they did an actual study. Um, and there's multiple studies, that's just one that we chose to cite um, for this work today, that it, it, was, it was revealed that when those rewards were removed, the students actually chose to read less. And so that gets us to pause to think then, okay, if that's the case then, then why are we continuing to do that? We're gonna talk about a little book that we have that can give you some ideas around what you might do instead 
and and why we need um, perhaps to do something to do something different. Yeah, and the other things too um, that are these these myths around reading motivation um, are are kind of centered around um, the downplaying of high interest tech. So I t- mm-hmm. I taught middle school. Um, and I had students that loved comic books. They loved reading um, like silly, silly things or things that might be, I don't know, I would air quote inappropriate, but they enjoyed them. So um, not downplaying those as high quality literature. If they want to read it, let them read it. They're reading, right? And then the last one is really this idea of balance of what's in our um, in our classroom libraries. So a lot of times we gravitate towards those, those fiction books because they're plentiful, right? But then you also have students that might get tired of reading about a puppy going to the store in a, in a, in a literature or a narrative type of um, writing style. They might want to know the breed of that puppy. Where did that puppy come from? Or you know, how, how are the traits uh, on the dog in more of a nonfiction way? So we have to kind of consider all of these things. But the big one to really think about is um, rethinking how we incentivize our our reading to our students and thinking about not just having like a March is reading month, but every month is a reading month. All right. So let's take a minute. We're going to think for a moment about what we mean by motivation. So when Heather and I got ready for this, we pulled the actual definition of what do we mean by motivate. So it can mean to incite or impel. Um, some synonyms, provoke, cause, or propel. So if you think about that for a moment, um, I'd like you to consider what, what that means for the stance of the learner themselves. So I'm currently reading this book that you see, that you see here on the right by Ellen Keen called Engaging Children. And in some of her opening chapters, she talks about Whose job is it, if you will, to do the motivating of our students, right? So I think very quickly, most of us as teachers would say, well, it's our job, right? We're, we're, the, we're the teachers. We need to be the ones up in the front of the classroom, you know, practically standing on our head or tap dancing to get them excited, right? When you think about what we're competing against in our technology world. But in her book, um, Ellen proposes something perhaps different, that where does the learner come into play with having some responsibility for their own motivation as well? And so I invite you to just pause and think about that for a minute. Where does that intrinsic motivation come? And how might we put some of that responsibility back on our students? Now that can only happen if the actions that we make as teachers are a little different, right? That we are making sure we're doing some of those things that Heather just talked about before, right? They're not relying on us as the teachers to give them the prize or the token. I'd invite you to just pause. I'm just gonna pause here and allow for some, some quiet reflection on that idea. Who is the main responsible one for getting the students motivated? And think about what's on and what you see on the screen as well with intrinsic motivation. I'll just pause for a moment and allow for some thinking. All right, Heather's going to talk a little bit more about engagement, which is directly linked to motivation, right? It's hard to talk about these two words without separating them. Yeah, and and oftentimes we we use them in education kind of interchangeably, right? So um, we... This, this model kind of represents the, we, the ABCs of, of engagement. And so we really need to focus on engagement across all three of these dimensions. So the first one is that behavioral. So this is kind of like what you would see, um, like the level of participation in a class assignment or within the classroom. So if you were to walk into a classroom and students appear to be working, they are engaged in that task in the behavior sense. Um, Now, the cognitive is a little bit different, and this is where um, students actually have to put forth effort to master the content, right? And this could be um, where this involves like students, um, student actions. So this could be like planning, answering, and asking and answering questions, providing evidence, and monitoring their own progress as, you know, as they engage in learning, um, problem solving, but also seeking out challenges. 
And then the last one that we have is this emotional engagement. And this is where we see interests and relationships that contribute to a student's ability to learn. And this is really based on student feelings. So does a student have safety in order to engage in discussions or pose those questions? Do they seek help? Are there positive supports? Do they have the perseverance to keep going on even though a task might be difficult? Have they built up their own self-efficacy? And we have to consider how we include um, our students' identities and, our, and their interests within, this, within these dimensions of engagement to increase and raise motivation. So what this really indicates is that we really need to see all of this happen. So we have to get our students involved emotionally. If they're emotionally involved, they're going to be cognitively involved in the task, but, and we're going to see it in how they engage in that task through their behavior. So we really need to have all pieces of engagement and not just focusing on the behavior one, more of the compliance one. And this leads us really nicely to um, what we call an arc of, um, of motivation. And then this arc of, motiva of motivation, and we're gonna share the text that um, this, this actually um, comes from, we have um, three pieces that kind of need to happen in order for students to um, feel motivated or be motivated around um, reading and writing. There has to be access. We have to have relevance and there has to be some choice. And so when we look to um, access, this really refers to students having a classroom with a wide variety of reading materials and writing materials um, and time and opportunity to read and write and talk about um, various topics. Um, it's not just about having books available with this in terms of access, but it's how the materials are made accessible and what teachers are actually doing to promote them. And so I think about things like how do we, do we just leave books just, you know, on a shelf and the spines are facing out, or do we pull books out and display them kind of like you would see at Barnes and Nobles, how some of them, are, the spines are facing out, but then you have ones that are um, you know, high interest or on display. So think about things like that. Do we have maybe a bulletin board where students are um, posting what they're reading about so that students can um, go and um, almost like a book talk, but book recommendations, things like that. And then relevance, are we providing that high interest, but moderately challenging and authentic reading experiences? So we have to consider both the text that we are using and the purpose why we're using it um, and why we're asking students to engage with it. And so this lens asks the question, does the text read by the student exist outside of a learning to read context? So are we reading a worksheet versus reading an actual book? And then we need to ask, are our students answering questions for me as the teacher or might they need to engage in a deeper peer discussion instead? And then lastly, this idea of choice. Are there opportunities for students to self-select books? Are the book, are, is there a variety of books available for students to self-select? Are they high interest? Are they relevant? All of these things need to be considered um, and work together within that arc of motivation to help build our readers and writers. Bridget, did you wanna add anything? Um, yes, just one thing. I know that, um, as I mentioned earlier about my own experience as a teacher, when I first started, right, I, I felt like I had more autonomy. We didn't have a particular published series that I was teaching from, right? I had, um, I was teaching more from a classroom library. I kind of came up in the whole language days. Those of you that um, maybe went to college in the 90s, like me, you are probably remembering that time. And so now today, I think, again, that the challenge that we face, uh, that our teachers face, is that they are given sometimes these scripted programs to teach from, right, where the texts are provided. So you might be thinking then, okay, how can I do that and, and still provide relevance, choice, and access, right? And so I, I think one of the answers is what we're going to talk about next on this, on this next slide. So while this session is not um, about 
Heather and I could do hours of sessions on what you see on the screen right now, hours and hours. Um, these are referred to as the MESA um, GELN, Essential Practices and Literacy for K through five. You can see the K through three on the left side and the four through five on the right. And in a moment, I'm gonna advance the slide and we're gonna see the six through 12 components as well. But what, what these are, just in a nutshell, and um, Heather, if you could drop the links in the chat for folks so that they can access these. If you're not familiar with what the essential practices are, these are a set of 10 supported practices. Right now, I'm gonna speak just to the K-5. Um, 10 research supported practices. It should be happening in every classroom for every child every day. And they're agnostic of any particular program or approach to literacy. So nowhere in these essentials are we going to see everybody should use this literacy program to teach these essentials or everybody should use this approach to teach. Rather, the practices are agnostic of that. So going back to the, to the dilemma that many of us find ourselves in when you're given this program to teach from, um, what the essentials can help you do is help you make decisions about what you're teaching from those programs and where to place your emphasis. Because in my experience with some of the commercialized and packaged literacy programs, um, there's so much packed in them, right? There's so much information. And as teachers, you need to be able to make decisions about where do I wanna place my emphasis? So these essential practices can help you do that. Um, and this is just the first essential um, listed for the K3 and the four or five. As you see, as you look on the screen, you can see that they mirror one another that as the teacher, um, you're making deliberate and research informed efforts to foster that motivation and engagement within and across lessons. And then you see those bullet points that go down. So I just invite you right now to um, skim and scan what you see on each side of the K3 and the four five. And again, in a moment, we're gonna go to the 612 as well. And I want you to see the connections um, that you see already with what we've been talking about so far. So I'm just gonna pause. The other thing I want to note about these essentials is that these are based on the current research, right? The, res the current research with real kids in real classrooms, and this work actually all comes from our state here in the state of Michigan. Um, so this is all based in that real research. And so I would say then how can we not do these things, right? And place emphasis in our classrooms on these, um, in, in these areas. So therefore it becomes making some choices with some of those scripted programs that you have in terms of what you're gonna let go of so that you can insert some of these high leverage practices we know that work. When you look at the 612 essentials, I want you to notice the title on the left that these are practices for disciplinary literacy, meaning um, they're not intended for every child, every classroom every day because they're discipline specific, meaning content specific. So there are standards, um, there are essential practices for math, a whole set for social studies, for science, and for English language arts. So what you see on the screen is just a snip of one of them, and then motivation and engagement is woven throughout all of them. So just quickly glancing at this, you can see at this top bullet at the upper right where it's speaking to um, what Heather mentioned earlier, those opportunities to create you know, literate identities. So we wanted to introduce you to these documents so that you have them. Again, the links are in the chat. You can go to literacyessentials.org, but we wanna get digging into a little bit more of the content next. So as we think about um, those research supported strategies as Heather outlined in, in the ARC, right? The A-R-C, um, below, um, each of these columns, you're going to see kind of your how to some specific things that you can do. So what we'd like to invite you to do now is to engage in what we're going to call a Think Inc. Jam. We're going to use the Jam board. So Heather, if you could grab that link for the Jam board, please, and drop it in the chat. And once she has that there, what I'm going to invite everyone to do on the call today is to open the Jam board, and I'll open it up in just a minute. I want to make sure that everybody has a chance to get that. 
And I'd like you to think, you know, what do you currently do in your classroom with each of these areas? When you get into the Jamboard at the top, you'll notice an arrow. There's a separate page for each, one for access, one for relevance, and one for choice. So I invite you to consider your own practice and think about the moves that you're already making with respect to access, relevance, and choice. And you can use these lists to help get you started. Um, and perhaps um, my hope, our hope is that you're going to see some of the things that others are posting as well, and perhaps begin to get some ideas of what you might um, consider trying as the fall and back to school comes pretty quickly here. I'm going to pause here and just give folks a chance to grab that link in the chat. Heather, are you able to see the Jamboard on the screen now? I can see it. And if you've never used a Jamboard, there's the toolbar over on the left-hand side where Bridget's kind of hovering over. There's a sticky note tool that will allow a sticky note to display and then you can in the sticky note and you can even change the color. And then we also have a text box note as well. And that's also on the, and then you can move them around if you grab on to the actual note or text box. The text box feature, is that second one from the bottom that has a T inside the box. And that'll help allow you to um, just kind of free type as well. Yeah, so if you haven't used Jamboard, it's, you know, it's completely free. It's part of the Google, you know, Google suite. Up at the top, you'll notice that this page that I'm displaying right now is around access. So you're putting your things around access. When you click, I clicked on the arrow at the top and now I've moved to the relevance page. So I'd invite you to think what you're doing around relevance. And then the third frame is, as they call them, is around choice. So see if you can put something on each of the frames. And if that first frame is feeling crowded around access, go ahead and click at the top and go to one of the other pages. We're going to give folks a few minutes to, um, to, to play around with that. And I want to encourage you to be specific, um, as specific as you can. Again, to, to find the other pages, you click on this top. I'm not sure if you can see my little mouse hovering over at the very top where it says next frame. Click on it, and then you can be on the relevance. If I click on it again, now I'm on the choice. It's like having giant, um, giant sticky notes or giant um, chart paper. And I see some notes here about access that um, some folks are new to uh, grade level, right? So starting a library from scratch, that is definitely a challenge. Um, one of my tips to you is to do um, a letter home or kind of like an all call. I know teachers that have done this when their families are clearing out their um, books that they might have at home and look for donations. Um, you can also, um, check um, some of the libraries will often do a, um, a used book sale where you can get books at a decent price as well. It is definitely a challenge though. We're just gonna take maybe one more minute. And I invite you to you know, read some of the um, things that other folks are saying as well as it might help you get some ideas. We're gonna take about 30 more seconds. All right, you will still have access to this Jamboard after we close the session, especially if you keep that link or bookmark it. I invite you to keep um, going back and, um, and adding to that. And bear with me just a moment. I'm gonna pull up our, back to our session. Bridget, can I share while you're pulling that up? Um, yeah. Some, some of the noticings just from what folks are putting on the Jamboard. Um, somebody said that they have an anchor chart that students can suggest books that they have read. I love that idea. You can even do bulletin boards or I had in my classroom a little box of cards where students, when they were finished with a the book, they made a book recommendation and put it on an index card and they put it in the, the box. Um, I'm seeing a lot of um, like text sets. Great ideas having kids share what they are reading, filling out those interest, interest surveys so that they can mm -hmm. incorporate those texts or those things that, are, that kids are interested in into the classroom libraries or even into the instruction. 
Um, somebody mentioned like Esperanza Rising with an ESL student and the main character um, had, and the student had things in common. So finding text where students can connect, make connections with. That's nice because we like to talk about windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors. And we're thinking about relevance. And then around choice, um, lots of choices, picture books, read aloud, mm -hmm. chapter books, letting, letting scholars choose the materials that they want to read, um, allowing, um, providing time outside of the literacy block. And, and that's really hard to find in, 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 a, in a school day, but even providing 15 minutes outside where students can self-select. These are really good answers. Good idea. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Are you able to see the screen again now, Heather, with the video? All right, we're gonna watch a, um, a video clip now that's coming actually from the K3 literacy essentials that we talked about um, from bullet five, specific around motivation. And even though this is kind of set in a K3 context, there are so many crossovers um, across the grade level. So if you're a middle school teacher, um, or even a high school a teacher, I think some of the ideas you're going to hear, um, you'll be able to um, adapt or just using a higher level text, it will work. So as you listen, please make notes about access, relevance, and choice. I invite you to, um, on your note paper, either have three sticky notes for each or make a three column. I'm going to hit play and off we go here. When teachers generate excitement about reading and writing, they foster literacy motivation and engagement within and across lessons. In these classrooms, teachers have been using a wide range of strategies to motivate students. Students in my classroom really know how much I love books and how much I love talking about books. I always make sure that they know that that's something that I not only enjoy here at school, but also when I'm at home, that that's a big hobby of mine that I really enjoy doing. Reading is a reward. It's something that we get to do and something that we look forward to doing, not something that we're ever forced to do or something that we frown upon in here. Since we place such great value on reading in my classroom, it really wouldn't make sense to use reading or writing as a punishment by having a student maybe read in the hallway or write during their recess. These are things that we get and want to do in our classroom. So it really would be counterproductive to use that as a negative consequence in our classroom. One problem I used to run into was that students would often come up to me in the middle of a lesson or any type of activity we were doing with a book that they were really excited about and they wanted me to read it to them. And I hated turning them away when they were excited about a book, but it was often at a time, you know, that just wasn't appropriate for a read aloud. So I came up with a bin. It's a please read bin. And it's something that I use to encourage students to add books to, so that way Whenever it is appropriate for us to do a read aloud, I can head over to the Please Read bin, pick a book out, and read that book to my students. And it's a way for them to take ownership in the read alouds, especially when it's a book that they know that they put in the bin. They get really excited because they know that that's why I'm reading it to the class. So we want reading not to be viewed as a chore, like something you have to be paid to do. So we want that to be intrinsic. We want the kids to really enjoy it. When I first started teaching, we would have these sticker charts that the kids would fill in once they read so many books or did so many minutes, and then they would get some type of a reward for that. And I felt like, great, they're reading a lot. And basically, they only did it for getting their reward. And really what we want to do is have kids read because they want to read. So what I use is positive peer pressure. And I kind of start off with my own positive peer pressure as far as I'm just excited about like a book that I just got in the class and I can't wait to share it with them. Getting the excitement level up is really what it's all about with reading. So I want to do that by previewing a book and getting super excited when we have a new book in our classroom or in our school. And I will use that excitement and do a short book blessing or book talk to get it, the excitement going. So I got some new books in our classroom. I just got them yesterday and I'm really excited about them. Um, 
this new book that we have, The Clock Struck One, it starts out like hickory dickory dock, and I'm like, oh, I've already heard that nursery rhyme. But then I turned the page, and I saw that when the clock struck one, something else happened. A cat woke up and started chasing the mouse, and like this hilarious chase keeps going on throughout the book on every hour. So I thought if you were in the mood for a chuckle or a giggle, that you would love to read this book. And another book that I just got is Volcanoes. And we were studying landforms in social studies this year. And I know that you guys were interested in volcanoes and so was I, so I wanted to read the book. But I got this great surprise when I read it. There's jokes in here. And there's also like silly little postcards that are in here too. And of course there's the great pictures and photographs in here. And I know some of you are interested in myths. And they have the myths about how the volcanoes were actually um, named in here too. So this book has a little bit for all of you in it. I'm gonna put them on the shelf and I know they won't last there long. When I'm reading is over, a lot of times you're gonna hear this collective, aww. And I say, all right, you know, if we do our other work really well today and we get through it quickly, you can have more reading time. We have some special events that we do with reading too, like they can do flashlight reading. We have our buddy class across the hall and they come over and so they are um, fourth and fifth graders. So they come over and we have buddy reading that can happen or we have like pajama day reading with a um, towel on the floor. So any reward is just reading in a fun, different way. As we're finishing our lessons in the closure from reading each day, the kids talk about their books as well. So the kids are now showing how much they enjoy their book and uh, it makes the other kids want to read the books. I remember one boy was reading Percy Jackson book and he was super excited about it and he talked about the things he enjoyed about the book at the end of the lesson and then somebody else said, when you're done, let me have it. A series that the students in my classroom absolutely love and has been one of my favorites for many, many years is Elephant and Piggy. So we actually have a special drawer in our classroom um, and we only open that drawer at certain times. It's something that we earn and when I open the drawer I just hear gasps throughout the room. They're so excited. Um, so we've been working on reading all of the books in that series in order um, throughout the year so that's something special that we get to do. Another thing that we do that's helping kids talk to kids about books and even other staff members is over my shoulder over here you can see that we've got the Nita book. That's our book recommendation site. On those cards the kids wrote down their favorite books so they're all four or five star books up there and as the kids need a book to look at and they don't know what to read they can go over and see what their friends are reading and kind of choose from there. And I started adding other people's recommendations up there too, kind of our guest recommenders. So our principal has one up there. And one of the little girls yesterday saw that our principal, Mrs. Beagleman, has a recommendation up there. So immediately she wanted to find that book to read it. We want them to become lifelong readers. We don't want them to just stop reading when they stop school. We want them to enjoy reading and keep on reading for the rest of their lives and pass that on to their kids. Learn more at literacyessentials.org. Okay, so if you're not familiar with literacyessentials.org, I encourage you to jot that um, site down. You're definitely going to want to check it out. Um, that's where that video clip came from, along with um, many, many more. And you can actually engage in um, video modules where you can um, take your learning even further and really dig into dig into the content. Heather, I'm just noticing our time. We're almost out of time. If we had had more time, we were going to put you into breakout rooms and give you some pro a little bit of processing time around that. So instead, um, what I'm going to do is share this next tool, and then we're going to do our, our closing, where we're going to invite you to um, think around access, relevance, and choice. And uh, make a commitment to something new, perhaps that you've heard or an idea that you heard that you're going to try. Um, but we wanted to share another resource with you, which I believe is this is completely adaptable um, for other grades. Um, Heather's going to drop this in the chat. So if you want to assess um, your students' um, motivation and kind of where they are in terms of their motivation to read. This is a motivation tool that's been put together. As you can see, it's called the, you know, the, read, uh, the Motivation to Read Profile. 
Um, our authors that we've referenced a few times, Marinette and Gambrell, were a part of this work. They are also the authors of this little book. Hopefully you can see this, I'm holding it up on the screen. Heather has it too, the No More Reading for Junk, Best Practices for Motivating Readers. Um, I think the content is applicable um, across grade levels as well. I do believe if you do a, a search that there is a, a, if you're a K-1 teacher, I believe there's also a motivation profile um, for younger students as well, perhaps even as older students. Although I think this one could be used with older students as well, if once you take a look at it. If you're a secondary teacher, I encourage you to take a look um, at this one as it is and see how you might be able to even modify that a little bit. All right, so before we close out, we wanted to make sure that you were familiar with um, the other sessions that are coming up. We're here on August 4th with Motivating Readers and Writers. We have more sessions throughout the rest of the month. They're all completely free. Um, we just ask that you register for them like you did today. Um, so um, we can also put this link for you again so that you can learn um, about more of these and please feel free to share um, to share these um, with your colleagues as well. So as we get ready to close, what we'd like to invite you to do in the chat is to open up the chat and go back to your to the thinking around access and relevance and choice, kind of those though that arc, right? To help us kind of remember how we can motivate um, our students. And you've been activating a lot of what you've already been doing, right? In so far, we've been, but now we'd like you to think around something new that you heard or saw today in the session that you think you might wanna try and to make a commitment to that by, um, if you're willing to be vulnerable, to put that in the chat for us. Something that um, around access, relevance or choice, just pick one. You could list that first, whether you're picking access and then what it is that you're going to do, relevance, put a hyphen and what you're going to try or do or choice and then be specific. So we'll just pause for a moment to give folks a chance to do that. And as folks are dropping that in the chat, I wanted to point out that um, my contact information and Heather's contact information is on the screen. So feel free to um, snap a photo of that if, you, if you'd like. We are available to um, come to your school and do some of this work directly you know, with your staff if that's something that um, your school leadership is interested in. That's, that's what we do here, Wayne Risa, right? We are a service organization. So we're happy to support you um, in that way as well. And I'm seeing lots of great things coming in in the chat, Heather, people making some commitments around all of the things. I love it. I, somebody said that they were gonna maybe look to purchase some books, um, additional books for their classroom library. Um, Thinking about that, I, books are expensive, but maybe um, maybe putting things on an Amazon wish list and sharing wish mm -hmm. lists like PTOs if you have that organization, um, or even a donors choose if you come up with a donors choose that might be a way to kind of offset those costs, or even going to, I mean, I love I love a good garage sale if I can find books. Sometimes garage sales people are getting rid of you know books that their children mm -hmm. no longer reading, but might be perfect for your classroom. So even thinking about other ways to get it before necessarily purchasing. So we wanna thank you for your time today. As we said, we just scratched the surface. Thank you for making the commitment to something around access, choice, or relevance. Um, it's exciting to see that. We found that when you write it down, you're more likely to do it. Um, again, we wanna say thank you for your time today. Um, and Heather and I will linger here for a moment or two in case you have any questions. But we hope to see you at some of our future Blitz sessions as well. Have a great afternoon, everyone.